Hi, I'm Whitney Mason, the director of the Microsystems Technology Office. We are very excited to tell you our thoughts about the, what the future could hold and solicit your help in creating this future. I hope you have questions, actually, and if you do, please send them to the email address here. This book was recommended to me when I came back to MTO, and we were very fortunate to have Dr. Chris Miller come give us a talk in February of this year. Chris is an economic historian specializing in Russia at Tufts University, and I asked him how a specialist in Russia ended up writing a book about the history of the transistor. He told me he set out to write a book discussing how, despite an overwhelming advantage in money, manpower, and materiel, the Soviet Union lost the Cold War. His thesis was that the U.S. persevered because of more exquisite systems like longer-range missiles or stealth and other high-performance military equipment. His background research, however, uncovered that the differentiator was transistors, the ability to manufacture compute in small form factor that could be put on weapons allowed the United States to do more with less. So I say to you, only somewhat grandiosely, that Moore's Law won the Cold War. Chris went on to say that Moore's Law is as much about manufacturing, supply chains, and marketing as it is about physics and engineering. And thus the questions we are asking in MTO are, what's the next scientific disruption? What's the next ecosystem disruption? And what's the next market disruption? Now, when I talk about the next revolution, there are people who tell me that we aren't done with the current revolution. And of course, there is always more work to do. But there are more problems in the world than DARPA has program managers to address. When DARPA started nearly uh, over 60 years ago, government spending comprised nearly 70% of the country's R&D budget. And now industry spending on R&D is over 70% uh, of the country's budget. And that makes me think that we need to be very selective about the problems we choose to solve. You all have seen a chart like this one uh, probably a thousand times showing the progression of Moore's Law from the initial integrated circuits to VLSI, copper interconnects, 3D transistors, and the chiplet ecosystem and the importance of advanced packaging. DARPA's effort over the last 20 or so years have culminated in ERI 2.0, which focuses on three-dimensional heterogeneous integration, where heterogeneous in this context has meant different foundries and or different materials. And of course, our anchoring program, Next Gen Microelectronics Manufacturing, which should open up the world of 3DHI to the community. I will emphasize that we remain dedicated to fulfilling our commitment to the country to drive this important technology availability to academia, government, and the industry. But it's time for us in MTO to pivot to the future. And this is why. Five years ago, I think we felt as a community like we were spitting in the wind. The importance of Moore's Law was getting lost in the rest of the noise. Certainly, the reported ending of Moore's Law has entered the lexicon, and, and DARPA started the Electronics Research in Initiative, ERI, and now ERI 2.0, but it was not something the popular press was crying about. And this has clearly changed. Everyone knows about the importance of chips and why dominance in the integrated chip arena is so important to our national security and our economic security, which is redundant because economic security is national security. But just look at these headlines. Billions, 280 billions, heterogeneous integration of different types of materials, heterogeneous integration, industry, Samsung, Intel, TSMC, NGMM and programs like ultra-wide band gap semiconductors and M-Studio are going to broaden these materials and techniques and allow prototyping of exciting capability. But DARPA, in particular MTO, needs to pivot to the next disruption. From a scientific disruption perspective, we are looking into three areas. I call them picks, kicks, and oiks, um, photonic circuits, quantum circuits, and organic circuits. Of course, we have been working in photonics, but we want to extend the dimensionality, for instance, in space uh, and in frequency. We also have a robust quantum effort, but we want to focus more on that of all sorts, computing, sensors, communications, networking, and organic circuits. I'm intentionally not calling it bioelectronics because when someone says bioelectronics, they invariably mean sensors for bio purposes, and that is not what we mean. What we mean is using bio for DOD applications like com compute, uh, maybe radiation tolerance, uh, and bio for electronics. Can I use biology, for example, to heal my electronics? 
MTO considered the question, is the progression of silicon transistors and the impact of 3D HI on the verge of falling off a cliff, not because of the physical limitations of the transistors, but instead the limits of the world's energy capacity. The projection of AI's thirst for computing capacity cannot be supported by the world's energy infrastructure. In other words, we can't build enough power plants fast enough. In addition, the energy and resources used to make advanced microsystems continues to rapidly increase, and it's simply not sustainable, leading to the question of what is the next ecosystem disruption. The opportunity for infrastructure disruption was inspired by our visit to the Smithsonian's Thomas Edison exhibit, Lighting a Revolution. What the curator said to us was while the light bulb was an innovative invention, it could be argued that the infrastructure developed to maintain the light bulb was actually the greater disruption. When people wanted uh, light bulbs in their homes, electricity was piped into their homes, and that changed the entire world, enabling further innovations in the form of toaster ovens and microwaves, and eventually computers and cell phones. Some of the greatest disruption opportunities are going to be created through a new microsystem manufacturing ecosystem, through environmentally sustainable manufacturing, the development of new tools, um, and the manufacturing science for rapid convergence of concept to microsystem products to support a first-to-market mentality, all enabled by changing the perspective from the infrastructure as support to the infrastructure as unlocking opportunities for disruption. I think of two stories when I see these pictures. And first, there is there is pride. Uh, it is pretty cool when the President of the United States holds up a wafer at the White House and talks about the importance of your office's technology to United States national security. But the story I really see is that we are spending $52 billion and growing to get our own stuff back. We invented the transistor, the integrated circuit, the manufacturing ecosystem, and created the market. We have to consider the consequences, not only of the technology, but also how we transition it and to whom we transition the technology. This is tied to the economics, of course, of technology. The cost of the transistor, for example, decreased every year as the technology advanced. And this generated an entirely new marketplace that allowed the sustainment and drove further advances in a self-sustaining cycle. MTO believes that disruption occurs when we create a new marketplace rather than move an existing marketplace along its vector. So MTO will think about transition with a renewed focus on commercialization to stay ahead of the rest of the world economically, but strategically and prudently so that the United States military stays ahead of everyone. This is what I call dual use by design. Here's our new logo uh, and our new motto, dominate the microsystems ecology militarily and economically, which is maybe a little aggressive, but maybe that's the point. This seems like the right time to say that I am the second least important person on the floor. The deputy director is just a smidge less important. These people are the actual important people that are going to change the world. They can choose to follow my strategy or come up with new disruptive ideas that don't fit. From that, you should take two things away. Number one, interact with them, and we will ignore no disruptive idea whether it fits in the strategy or not. Now let's talk about how to interact. A professor told me that one of his colleagues told him that he could write a white paper for DARPA and either he could put it in the trash or watch DARPA put it in the trash. And that is funny and sad. And it's funny and sad because it's true. You can see under the PM name their notional areas of interest, or at least today's notional area of interest. Things change. The PM most likely to be interested in your idea is a specific person or persons. If you have a magical idea, but no PM is interested in it, then it won't happen. The PM is the champion of the idea. If your idea doesn't gain traction, that could be a momentary pitfall. And next quarter, a PM might show up that is interested in that idea. Keep trying. Or you could consider coming to DARPA and being the champion yourself. More on that in a minute. If you can't determine the best PM to talk to, ask me. I can help. And I'll add that adding, having a conversation with a PM or PMs before going to the trouble of writing a white paper or proposal can save you time and that pesky throwing in the trash thing. 
PM tenure is anywhere from two to six years, with four being the most common. This means that DARPA loses about 25% of PMs every year. This is mostly uh, a good thing. Uh, it keeps new ideas coming in all the time and also gives us fresh perspective on old ideas. And when people leave, they take that new perspective back to where they came from, or they take their new perspective on to other adventures. This place changes you. I used to joke that Whitney Mason from DARPA was funnier, smarter, better looking than Whitney Mason from Night Vision, where I worked before. None of which is true, of course, but I do have more range. I have a broader view of the world than I did before I came here. And that's because of the people you saw on the previous slide and others liked them that challenged me, taught me, and encouraged me. If you have ever wondered what it might be like to be one of us, please reach out. You can talk to me, uh, or you can talk to our recruiter, Doug Bryant. His email is shown. And if you're wondering what it takes to be a successful PM, I think it's intellectual curiosity, a personality that embraces risk, and a desire to contribute to national security. Being a program manager is a big-time commitment. Somebody uh, recently said to me, commitment with a capital C and you might have competing priorities right now. The Microsystems Exploratory Council might be a good way to contribute today and find out if DARPA might be right for you. The MEC is a horizon scanning group that helps MTO identify new vectors not in our current strategy. MTO tries to be about 10 years out on technology. The MEC helps us think about ideas that might be ready in the 15 to 20 year horizon. It is a much lower time commitment than being a PM. It is a good introduction to how DARPA works, and I guarantee you will learn something. If you might want to dip your toe in the water and provide service to the country without being a PM, this might be a great avenue. Dan Raddick from IDA manages this group uh, and would be delighted to talk to you. I'll wrap up by saying I believe it takes a village to move technology that changes the world. In whatever way makes sense to you, as a program manager, as a part of MEC, or as a performer, please come be a part of ours.